Mark chapter 9. When you have it, say, I have it. Beginning at verse 14, it says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. And what are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. I think we've all been here. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, because you got nosy folk, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you to come out of him, never to enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him uh, to his feet. And he stood up. I would like to use for a subject this afternoon. I'm tired of this. Do me a favor and say, neighbor, neighbor. I'm just tired of this. Um, Julius Caesar is probably the greatest Roman emperor to ever lead that empire. Actually, many people may not know this, but Julius Caesar tried to be a priest earlier in his life, but it didn't work out. Um, then eventually he enlisted into the army or the military <clears throat> and grew in the military ranks to eventually he worked himself to be the emperor uh, of Rome. Later on in his life, he began to have some issues that some thought was the curse of the gods. And that curse of the gods was him having seizures. Um, it wasn't a curse, it was a neurological disorder because that's what uh, epilepsy is. It's a neurological disorder that's marked by a sudden uh, episode of sensory disturbance, loss of consciousness, and convulsions associated with certain things going on in the brain. But during this time, they didn't have the medical science to identify that, so they thought it was a curse of the gods. It's interesting that even when we think about this today, I don't want to talk about seizures in itself as it relates to a physical um, activity, but I want to talk about spiritual seizures. The epilepsy is actually... Uh, has a Greek origin, and it means to seize or to attack. It means to take. And what's happening on this youth day is our generation, this generation, is dealing with the fact that the enemy is constantly attacking them, trying to seize what he's that trying to seize what God has placed inside of them. It, it's interesting because if we can all admit to it. Excuse me. If we can all admit to it, there have been times in our lives where we can say, God, I didn't do everything right. But yet we had somebody who prayed for us. We had somebody interceding on our behalf. And that's what we see in this text. We see the father bring his son to Jesus because he realizes his son needs help. When, even when you didn't have enough sense to pray for yourself, somebody else is praying for you. And what we see in this text is the power of a parent who brings their child to Jesus because they understand there's some things that only God can fix. And so when we see this, parents, I want you to understand that your example, your life is the thing that your children will follow. Because your children will not do what you say, your children will do what you do. Isn't it interesting? We say to them, 
do what I say, don't do what I do, but I thought actions speak louder than words. So now you're doing something, saying something else, and they end up doing the opposite because your actions really do speak louder than your words. And so the, the thing I want you to understand is that if you want your child to have a relationship with God, you have to show that. If you want them to love God, you have to show that. If you want them to be a praiser, you have to show that. If you want them to be a worshiper, you have to show that because they will do what they see. And this is why the enemy doesn't want you to come to church and express yourself uh, in praise and worship because he doesn't want your children to see it because where you plant seed, there will be a harvest. And so the Bible talks about this father who brings his son to Jesus. And the Bible says this. Look at it. He says, this spirit that has attacked him has robbed him of his speech. The enemy wants to close your mouth. I can't say that enough, that, that, that it's in your mouth. The Bible says it like this. You know the scripture, life and death is in your hands. Life and death is in your feet. No, life and death is in your heart. The Bible clearly says that life and death is in the power of your tongue. It's in your mouth. And even though we quote it, we don't always respond in that manner. It's interesting that while Jesus was on the cross, they nailed his hands, they nailed his feet, but they forgot to tape his mouth. And this is where we get the seven last words. This is where we get, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is where we get, today you will be with me in paradise. It is on the cross when Jesus is dead that he says, in thy hands I commit my spirit. It is at the cross, he says, it is finished. It is on the cross, he says, Eli, Eli, Sabathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We wouldn't have had those words if the devil would have shut his mouth. Uh, but because the power of life and death is in your mouth, you have to start declaring what you want God to do because the enemy is trying to rob you of your speech. And this is why Bart, blind Bartimaeus, when he was on the side of the road, he hollered, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Other people was like, you should be quiet. That's too loud. You're making too much noise. He said, Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. Then when Jesus got the attention, he said, all right. He said, all right, bring him to me. Then the people who told him to be quiet all of a sudden was willing to help him. Because you can allow people who have what you need to tell you to be quiet when you're trying to get what you need. You can see I can't. So I'm going to holler till I get his attention so I get me some vision. See, some people don't have vision, and people who do want to tell the people who don't to stop. I want vision like you want vision. I want to see like you see. I want to do like you do. And so the Bible says that he cries out. It's in your mouth. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 6, I believe, that when the children of Israel walked around the walls of Jericho, that after they did the seventh time on the seventh day, what did they do? They hollered. They hollered, they screamed until the walls fell down because there's power in your mouth. You got to understand that there's frequencies that comes, that comes out of your mouth. And, and so I explained this before, but I'll explain it again. One time I was talking to my wife and I said, I said, babe, I said, um, we was watching TV and an opera singer came on and she hit a note. And, you know, it was a high note and then the glass broke. And I said, wow, I wonder how that lady broke that glass. And, and so my wife explained to me, she said, it's actually science. She said, what is happening is everything that's ever been created has been created on a frequency. <laughs> everything that has been existed, God spoke it into existence, which means it had to be created on a frequency. What happened was when the opera singer hit the note, she actually hit the note that, that was on the same frequency that the glass was made out of. And if you stay and hit that frequency long enough, it breaks. This is why the walls of Jericho fell down, because they hit the frequency that the wall was created on. And I came to tell you, I don't know what the enemy built in your life. I don't know what he's trying to hold you back from. But if you can open your mouth and hold that frequency long enough, what was a barrier, you'll be walking on it because it has to come down. But life and death is in the power of your tongue. So we see him try to shut his mouth, but then we not only see that, we also see in Mark's gospel and then Luke's gospel, it says that, that he tried to throw him in the fire. Tried to throw him in the fire. The enemy tried to throw him in the fire to burn him. 
See, young people, let me talk to you right quick. You live in a different time than I lived in when I was your age. When I was your age, when I was in middle school, high school, the internet was just basically picking up traction at that time. And so if you wanted to, to, to introduce yourself to a female, you know, you had to walk up to them. So only about 30% of the room know what I'm talking about. You had to walk up to her. Hey, how you doing? My name is, your name is, you know, you caught my eye. Whatever lame line you had at the time, you used it to see whether or not she will respond. And some of y'all remember this. You had a pen and a piece of paper. Come on, brothers. Y'all don't leave me out here hanging. I know exactly what I'm, you had a piece of paper. Or if you were smooth with it, you'd be like, all I have is a pen. If I get your number, you could just write it in my hand. You know, that kind of stuff. And, they would, and, she, <laughs> and she would write the number in your hand, and you would try your best not to make sure your hand got sweaty. You wasn't shaking hands because you didn't want to lose that number. But, but now it's different. The interaction is different. And so now the way you guys interact is through social media. And so I want you, hey, here's how you get burnt. Understand, number one, that everything you do will be tracked. When I was coming up, we did stuff that was, you couldn't trace it after we were done. I'm just giving you a heads up. You did it, nobody knew why. I didn't have a phone, you couldn't track me. You didn't know what my location was. I didn't have a camera. I didn't have, we had pagers. Y'all remember the beeper, like, and you, you had the clear one. The clear one was like, make sure you had, you, anyway, I'm sorry. You had the different colors. Hey, what's a pager? Don't worry about it. It's just, then you had a two-way. But now, y'all take pictures of everything. And y'all take pictures of yourselves and certain parts of yourselves that you send to others privately thinking that it's never going to show up someplace else. It's going to burn you. It's interesting that now companies will fire you if your life doesn't match up with their values. So you could be in Los Angeles or Las Vegas or Seattle or Cancun, Mexico, and you did something wilding out in a whole nother country and posted on social media, and by the time you get back, they're saying, thank you for everything you've done. Today's your last day. Now, how is it that the, the corporate world can tell you the kind of life you're supposed to live, but when you come to church, the pastor can't say nothing about how your life ain't right and you need to get that together, and you say, I'm judging you. So don't get burnt, okay? The other thing is being overwhelmed. This generation is overwhelmed. You've been exposed to so much so early. All you need to go is to www.whateveryoulookingfor.com and you've been exposed just off one internet page that would change your life because you've been exposed to too much and you're trying to process all of this and so now you think you are able to do more because you've been exposed to more but just because you've seen more don't mean you know more. And so you, be, you start thinking that you're the subject matter expert just because you watched it on YouTube, but you never actually did it. And so we, we, it's a challenge. And so I'm only saying this not to bash you. I'm telling you there's a difference. And I want to make sure that you're not overwhelmed by somebody bullying you and, 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 and telling you you're not good enough or you're not smart enough or you're not pretty enough or you're not tall enough. Or they talk about your weight, whether you're skinny or they feel like you're overweight or your hair not long enough or short enough or your complexion isn't right or something's wrong with your race or you're too white or you're too black or you're too you too. Uh, Latino, you to this, you and so everybody has something to say, and it's interesting that people have stuff to say on social media that has a name like white shirt 2201 black, you know what I'm saying, it's like who are you, what's your real name because the crazy people in the room want to find the IP address and they want to track the IP 
if you can find the IP address and be able to trace who that person was, you just want to just buy a quick ticket, fly over to another city, knock on the door and say, now say it to my face. That's only for about 30% of y'all. The other ones, y'all too say. But it's amazing how somebody will hide behind some fake name and rip you apart. But now you got to deal with what was said, even though you don't know who said it. I remember when I was younger, I used to be bullied by this guy in uh, middle school. He used to bully me, and I never fought him back because I was afraid I would lose if I did. So some of you in the room, you're not fighting back because you think you're the loser, and you never engaged in battle. And so when you get the confidence to say, I'm not going to let you push me around. I'm not going to let you do this. Let me tell you something. People will respect you when you stand your ground. They may not like you, but they will respect you. And so we have all these different things. Like, I remember when I was coming up, things were just different. Like, even with school, like, you know, when I went to school, they had something called books. <laughs> yeah, have you, I don't know if you ever seen one of those. It's like a book. It has pages. It has a, a binding, right? It has, it has a book. And so, and it, some of y'all remember this. You had, you know, social studies and language arts and chemistry and biology and algebra, whatever book, whatever class you had, you had to take all of those books. And you had to stuff them in your book bag. And then some of y'all had so many books. And then you had a notebook for each class on top of that. And you had, to, you had to carry that like you was going up to a mountaintop with all of this luggage on your back. And you would get home and spread all the homework all over the table trying to get it done. Today, it's all on a computer. I told the boys, I said, y'all can never get away with anything the way I got away with stuff. Because if you say you turn it in, all I got to do is go to the website and log in and say, no, you didn't. It's right there. You didn't turn it in. As a matter of fact, you passed that, but you failed that. That's late. They can't get away, they can't get away with anything. I got away with stuff, people. <laughs> now, when I was coming up, I was very creative <laughs> in, in the writing expression of duplicating <laughs> signatures. <laughs> That's called forging. All right? So what you would do, because some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, so I have to explain it. So what forging is, is you look at your parents and you see how they sign their name. So you have to put practice in people. This doesn't come overnight. This takes practice. So now you have to figure out how to hold the pen or the pencil a certain way so that you can get everything to match up as closely as you can to your parents' signature. I have to admit, to this day, I still sign Mootry the way my dad signs Mootry. So not that I forced his name that lot, a lot like that, but it's just I just did it. So no judging. So... So I had, you know, I did that. So I remember one day I got an F on a test. And it was a big fat F on the top of the paper. I'm like, oh my God, my, my dad's going to kill me. And, and I'm going to go missing. And my friends are never going to see me again because I got this F. And it was in math out of all classes. So it was math. It's all right. So all of a sudden, ding, I got this bright idea. So since she did it in uh, black, I decided that I would change this F into a B. I can't get no help in this sanctified church. So you just curved it, you know, halfway, and then curve it again, FB. And then either you took the risk. See, so this is where forging came in. Why am I telling all of this? But this is where forging came in. Forging came in when, when the teacher did it in red. And I couldn't get around changing the F to the B, so that's when I had to go to, you know, plan B, which was mastering, forging the name. And I remember, oh my God, I remember one time we was in a grocery store and he ran into my teacher. Oh yeah, Simi's doing great, yeah, he, that, that test. He said, yeah, yeah, he's, he's doing pretty good. She's like, no, he's struggling. I'm like, this. You know, I, was, I had a seizure. I, I just, just, I just, no offense, I'm, I'm not trying to say it in a funny way. I'm just like, Lord, I'm, I'm gone. I, I, 
make me invisible. Just. But y'all can't get away with stuff like that. There is no forging. It's all technology. You, there's no signing of a piece of paper. See, y'all don't even know nothing about tracing paper. See, I'm telling you, y'all don't know. There's some experiences y'all are, y'all are void of that if you would have had them. But y'all deal with things differently. It's magnified, actually. See, the problem is, this generation, they're fighting Goliaths that we should have fought. Okay, let's deal with the text. David shows up, right? Doesn't he drop off lunch to his brothers at the army site with the soldiers all on one side and the Philistines on the other side? And they should be fighting Goliath, but none of them would step up. So then a child did a man's job because a previous generation didn't want to address what they should have addressed. And so now this generation is fighting a Goliath that we should have handled. See, you're trying to skip over stuff and don't want to address it and sweep it under the rug and lie and deny that it even happened. And, and so now, so this generation is dealing with a lot. They've been exposed to a lot. The enemy's trying to rob them of their speech. He's trying to throw them in the water, trying to overwhelm them. And now they're thinking about suicide and killing themselves. And we got all these different things happening because they don't feel good about themselves because somebody said something. So now what's happening is the Bible says he begins to have seizures to seize him. And when someone has a seizure, the body stiffens. And what's happening is this generation is having more seizures than you could even imagine. When they walk in and find out that their parents are not going to be together, they lock up. When they find out that they're being evicted from a home, they lock up. When they've been verbally abused, they lock up. When they've been physically abused, they seize. When they've been sexually abused. See, and so they're going through so much that when we look at this generation, they've experienced so much. And what we try to do is just say, oh, just pray about it and tap them on the back. Like that's always going to solve everything. There's some things, you, everything you need to pray about, but this, there may be additional help and assistance that you may need. Sometimes you need community. Sometimes you need to be able to talk to somebody without the other person on the other side judging what you got to say. You need to be able to communicate and connect with other people. Sometimes you need a couch. Sometimes you need a pillow. Sometimes you need a Kleenex. So, so whatever, you, whatever it is, right, we got to get it. But we're, that, this generation is dealing with so much that they don't trust and now they don't believe God. That's why the parents got to be the example to bring them to Jesus. The Bible says that when Jesus comes, he says, what's going on? Y'all talking? He says, yeah, my son has these seizures. It, it, it causes him to, to become rigid. He gnashes at the teeth. And Jesus says, okay. But then some people who knows he want to know what's going on. My question is, do you have friends or do you have reporters? Because some of the people you call friends share all your business, talk to everybody else about things you shared in secret. They take it out and make it a public. See, some of y'all think you're famous. There's only paparazzi, and your paparazzi are your friends, and they only leeching onto you because they feel like you're going somewhere, but yet they're jealous of you, and when you get there, they're trying to get information on you that they can use on you. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying against you when you get in This is why you got to keep your circle small sometimes. People want to come and see, oh, Jesus is over, he's going to help them. Jesus said, all right, let me go ahead and handle this real quick. Watch this. The Bible says, Jesus looks at the boy and says, come out of him. The Bible says, when the spirit saw him, yeah. not when the boy saw him, when the spirit saw Jesus, it started acting up. You know you're close to your miracle. When the spiritual battle for territory yeah. kicks up to an all-time high, when you start getting closer to Jesus. It's a sign. When you start getting closer to God, 
the battle intensifies, that the fight begins to increase because the enemy is fighting over territory. You, you got to hear what I'm saying. He, the, battle, the battlefield is in our mind. He's fighting over territory. He doesn't want you to win. So the way he makes you think that you lost is through a battle. And so now he becomes rigid. He becomes hard. The enemy is trying to seize him in that moment. And this is why we miss moments, because we allow the enemy to take away from us in that moment the thing we need. So now we're sitting in church and we're missing moments. Because while our hands should be lifted in honor to God and reverence to him. I was, I was watching a game. I was sharing it with the other service. I was watching a game. Portland. Um, can't remember. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. And the point guard um, shot almost like a half court three. And it went in. The whole place went bananas. I was like, oh, my God, because nobody saw it coming. The men, grown men, run, pick them up. Now, granted, all of them sweaty. <laughs> Probably don't smell their best. But they picking each other up, falling on the ground, jumping on each other, screaming and crying, all that. And it's amazing how we do that over a leather ball going through a net. And come to church and have a seizure? Now you can't move? God has done way more for me than that. I like sports. But when it comes down to God and that, when I think about everything that God has brought me through, I have to give him praise because I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for God. Someone, look at where you live and what you have and where you work and everything you have. God did that. You didn't do that. Who brought you out of, out of, a, a, out of a sick bed and gave you back your mental faculty and gave you the ability to, to bounce back? Who, ke- who gave you peace in the middle of a storm? Who kept you together when you was getting ready to fall apart? Who kept your tongue when you was getting ready to say something sideways to somebody? If it had not been for God, you wouldn't be here. So when I think about everything he's done, I say something. There's a phrase that we say today, and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Such such and such, self-made millionaire. There is nobody self-made. There is no one self-made. If you got there, somebody else helped you. Somebody introduced you to somebody. Somebody allowed you to walk into a room. Somebody gave you a few dollars. Somebody gave you some advice. Somebody took you out to lunch. Somebody patted you on the back. On the back. Somebody gave you encouragement. And when you look back out of everything that God has brought you through, when you get there, you don't get there and ignore everybody who poured into you and gave you something. You think everybody who made whatever contribution they made. So stop with this. I made it. You didn't make it. God did that. And he put people in your life for you to get to where you are. And shame on us when we finally get there and we kick everybody else to the curb like they didn't do nothing. I thank God for everybody who helped me or hurt me because if they didn't do it, I wouldn't be the man I am today. Thank you for the hurt. I didn't appreciate it and I didn't like it. But now I know what it feels like to have a knife in my back. Thank you for the encouragement when I didn't think I could make it. Thank you when people said, what are you doing? You don't do it right. That God would send people to help you. You didn't do it on your own. It is not good for man to be alone. You can't do this thing by yourself. Jesus is in our lives And he frees the boy. But there's something in this text that's extremely powerful, and I don't want you to miss it. The Bible says this. The the man said that the spirit robbed him of his speech. When Jesus comes in Matthew's gospel, he says, I rebuke this deaf and dumb spirit. In other words, the reason why you're not talking is because you're not hearing. I don't even want to deal with that right now, but I'll just give you that for free. Um, But then he says this. He said, come out of him and never return again. 
Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, Bible says when a spirit is cast out of a person, it walks around the neighborhood. Then it comes back to the same house it left. And when it finds it clean and empty, it goes and brings seven more devils stronger than himself. And so the, the second battle is worse than the first. That's what the Bible says. Here's the challenge. I'm about to help you in your prayer life. Some of you have been asking God for certain things to leave, but you never declare for it not to come back. He said, this struggle right here, you ain't going to have this one again. Never again will you ever have something to seize you, to take you, to rob you of a moment. We have to start praying, God, not only free me of what's going on inside of me, but I pray that it never happens again. I pray you never have another bad relationship. I pray that you never have somebody to say something to break you down to the point that you can't move on. I pray that you have the testimony of Moses. The enemies you see today, you will see no more. And I pray you do like Miriam. When you see them drown, you grab a tambourine and you start praising God because you know that if it had not been for God moving on your behalf, you wouldn't have the praise you have right now. Isn't it? It's so... He says, come out and never go back. The Bible says that the boy is laying there and he looked like a corpse. He looked like a corpse, but he's free. He looked like he's dead, but what it really is, is he's exhausted from the fight. I'm exhausted. I'm just trying to get my strength back. But other people say, oh, he dead. Isn't it interesting how people write you off? When they look at you, because we judge books by the, book by the cover. People judge you by what you look like. Tall, short, what you wearing, how your hair is cut, all that kind of stuff, what you drive. Everybody looking at it, and they measure you up, and then they say, oh, this is the kind of person they are. And they don't even know you. It's interesting how they, they say, oh, he's dead. He's not dead. He's just exhausted. But here's the thing. He looks dead, but he's free. Some of y'all bound, but you look good. See, some of y'all have a face, and some of y'all faces have a time limit, right? So you fussing all the way to church, but then you turn on Park Lane. Now you, your face begins to transform with a smile. And then you turn onto the property and they wave at you and you wave back. And then you get out the car and you come in and they go welcome to the book and you go, hey. And you come in and you sit there with a smile on your face knowing good and well you hate the way your life looks right now. Because your face has only been, your face has a timer of about an hour and a half. So by the time you get back to your car and get back on Park Lane, that smile now turns into a frown because you look good but on the inside you're messed up and I would rather look like I'm dead and be free than to walk around and be all jacked up it's, it's, it's interesting it's interesting I remember reading a book and it was a guy talking about millionaires this guy had a Porsche and was living in this like million dollar condo and, and had tailor made suits and you know all kind of stuff and you know Rolex watches and Jewelry, and so he looked like success. And met with his financial advisor, said so that man only got $1,000 in the bank. Another man walked in, older gentleman, he had a Rolex, but it was a very old one. And he sat there with khakis on and a blue uh, shirt tucked in. And the man looked at him and said, obviously this man has no money, I don't even know why he's talking to me. And his, his net worth was $4 million. Because some of us know how to look rich, but don't think it. Okay. So, so we, we, we go around trying to look like something. You, you, you try to 
try to go because you want to make sure you have the right presentation. So you get, and it's like, no, 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 that's not, that's not it. Because as Paul said to the women, it, 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 but it's a principle, you're spending so much time working on your outward appearance. That the inside is messed up, and we need to work on the inside. God is trying to work on the inside of us. But you don't get free until you get tired of the situation. Because now you're willing to fight. And can I tell you, God is trying to fight for you today. He wants you free. He picks the boy up. He stands to his feet. And now you got a new man who will never be in a moment where he's been seized. Where he'll have that attack again. I'm praying for our young people that whatever the enemy tried to do to destroy them, it won't work. It won't work. Why? Because you have to have the testimony to say, God did that for me. I'm tired of this, Pastor. Yeah, I know. But what you going to do? Keep talking to other people who can't help you with it? Or are you going to say, I'm going to get my son to Jesus so I can get the help he needs? Now, here it is, and I'm going to close. The Bible says Jesus asked him a question. How long has he been like this? He said since he was a child. When you look at the text and you kind of look at it more carefully, I don't know if this man, I don't know if this boy was a grown man. Some people think he was a, a grown man. That's why he said since childhood. But when I kind of look at it and kind of study a little deeper, the way it looks is that he had the struggle since he was a very young kid. And now he's a teenager still dealing with what he's been dealing with since he was younger. Whatever the case is, the reality is this has been going on for a while now. And some of you are tired, but listen to me. You're doing everything but getting to Jesus. You're doing everything but getting to God. You're going, you're going to the gym. Going to the gym is good. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Work out. Oh, I need to make sure I eat. Yep, you're right. Eat right. Oh, I need to make sure I get enough rest. Right, make sure you get enough rest. Oh, I, and you're doing everything else but the word. So now when you have, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to text you right now. When you have a problem, who the first person you call? Some of y'all don't call Jesus first. Some of y'all call your brothers or your cousin or your best friend or your mama or your spouse. That's the first one you call. And as you tell them and they tell other, a few other people, you don't think about it again. You move on and God was like, I, I would have helped you with it, but you didn't ask me about it. <laughs> when was the last time, seriously, you got on your knees just to thank God and not ask him for anything? That doesn't come around. That doesn't happen often because what we're doing, we're doing like the man did. I brought my son to your disciples. I expected if I brought him to them, they could help him. He had a mindset that if I got to the disciples, it would hurt. Let me tell you something. You can get to the disciples, but the disciple is not God. It is not Jesus. And so now when Jesus comes into the fact, so now they say this. Well, why couldn't we do it? Jesus says this, because y'all don't fast and pray. Y'all not doing certain things to get the result. If we are sick and tired of certain things happening, we have to say, you know what? This has to stop, and this has to stop here because I'm tired of it. I'm tired of hearing about kids wanting to take their lives. Tired of it. Tired of hearing about people for whatever reason. This makes no sense to me. That decides, you know what? I don't like my life. So I'm just going to find a school somewhere and take a bunch of guns and kill innocent people. At, I don't, I'm tired of hearing about politics. I'm tired of hearing about racism. 
I'm tired with the white versus the black, the black versus Latina, Latina versus the, it's all of this race. I am tired of, 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 the, of the lines and the systems that are in place to make some people poor. And let's get past this. We keep all, it's trying to keep the black man down, right? Look, there's some people who don't want even people in their own race to get more than what they have. It is bigger than that. Tired of always hearing fake news. Tired of the conversation being of no value. Tired of seeing us miss moments. Tired of just doing church. Tired of just coming in week by week. And it's the program. It's a part of the schedule. Tired. Tired of seeing people hungry and have no food. Tired of seeing people homeless when we have more than enough buildings and homes that we can house people temporarily. Tired of people who have unemployment because other people won't give them a job because they have a record. When somebody, if someone grew, grew up in a neighborhood and all they saw was drugs, the only thing they think they have sometimes it's the drug game. It wasn't necessarily a choice. It was like, it's a choice, but they felt like they had no other choice. I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired of people in the church, we fighting against each other because this church is traditional, this church is contemporary, this church you get to dress down, this one you get to dress up. I'm tired. I'm tired of people saying that service is too long, this service is too short. I'm tired. Do you buy real hair or some, <laughs> or fake one? I'm tired. <laughs> Just tired. Can we speak and have conversations of value? I declare that our children are not going to do it. I need everybody to stand to your feet very quickly. <laughs> 